Well, it's another one of those lovely Christmas Eve eves. The evening of the eve of Christmas Eve, that is Thursday the 23rd of, um, of December 2021. What an interesting year again. I thought I'd talk about a whole bunch of French, Gaelic, Gaelic, ga oh, it's hard to really define reality anymore when you try to say, is it French, is it the House of Bourbon, is it, what is it? Um, but how, but what I'd like to do is go through a few ideas about, and I'll go through a few ideas about what I think could be happening to us, uh, what has happened to us in terms of um, unrecorded immigration and um, attempts to uh, perhaps connect people to Australia. Australia's got a complicated story, as does every country in the world we're seeing. Everything is the story's either been half correct or it's half right, but they've not told you the other half. It's, uh, you can't trust it anyway, and they reframe things, they counterfeit things, like the Roman Empire. They say, oh yes, uh, uh, Emperor Nero was an emperor, but when you look at all the coins and you look at all the paraphernalia, it looks like it's just... It's just nothing, but uh, he only had Germany, of course, uh, where the Roman, these, these um, conquering Romans originally came from, because you look at all the busts, the actual, you know, the busts uh, from the chest up, they all look Prussian or Slavic. None of them look Italian. Uh, and anyway, Emperor Nero, all you had was London and the Tiberius River next to Rome and Germany is nobody. So who, who was who had the Roman Empire? Uh, it's, it's just odd when you look at the evidence. They just don't tell you much at all. It's truly made up and it has a psychopathic... Uh, you can tell with all history, so what is history? It's basically trying to work out how some of the... They're not just the winners, they're the psychopaths. They're not only, they, don't, they don't just defeat you. They take away your history and any, if there's anything good about it, they'll consume it. They'll take the best women or men, usually women, they, they become what they wear at skin. And and not only do they take what you've got, not only do they raise your history, they take everything from the past and you have, and, and your heritage is gone. And you lose everything. And you have to take on their stuff as a descendant of some orphan victim, which is what most of us are. So when we're looking at, I just want to talk about the French just loosely and try to see if I can connect some dots and I won't just exclusively talk about that. Here's an image. Uh, I think one of these people is La Perouse. You can take your pick, maybe it's him. I don't think it's him. I think it's the prince, king or someone. Anyway, we, we move on. Um, oops, there you go. That's the... I decided to... That's like, what is the interesting thing about Sydney, for example, where I think most of the French people migrate, emigrated to, or they had a colony here originally. And when I mean French, I mean people generally from France. But then again, we need to redefine that, and I'll explain that a bit later. Uh, I've got some music on from a YouTube channel, Classic Music. It's Spelt in a Germanic f spelling, but it's it's got French music. <laughs> okay, so just looking at this exciting map, we can see we have La Perouse here, which is obviously named after the Captain La Perouse, which mysteriously vanished. We need to talk about that. He um, La Perouse. Uh, okay, so we have also. This is assuming La Perouse is real, I think he is. Four Clues is also French. It's important to note that. That of the best places. Like if you're going to take over, you're going to become part of something. And you want it. Four Clues and North Head will be the places you'd want. In terms of the most pre prestigious. And on a military, 
military point of view, you might not put your, you won't put anything precious there, but you'll stake a claim to it, I guess. Which makes you wonder what's in these parts where it says Sydney Harbour National Park. Well, fair enough, they're not going to put, you know, it's good to make it public space, so that's good, but of course you'll need to, ask, someone needs to excavate it. Um, let's go to all the place names. Uh, Monterey, there's debate about where that name comes from. San Susi, some people think it's actually uh, a, a French Frenchification of a Germanic word. There you go. Um, you can take your pick. Brighton Le Sands is apparently after hotel, but once again, they were inspired to make it into a French name. And all these things have a little bit of a strange history to it. Uh, you've got Ramsgate, um, you've got uh, Maroubra over here, Maroubra, could be French, could be Gaelic, could be you know, Matraville, could be, you know, take your pick on where you think the names come from. Um, if we just go back to La Perouse himself, uh, where, where is he? This is actually on the point. Oh, let's go back, sorry. That uh, fort, it's called a Barbican. Uh, it's, it's actually located right here. And David Lyon from Ancient Australia History, I think it's called, pointed out that it's a Barbican, not a fort. And that's quite interesting because what it's supposed to do is look like it's it's got a bigger fort behind it. So when you're looking at it from the, as you're passing in, you should be more terrified. Say, oh wow, that's, that's, they've got a big fort there, we better watch out. When it's really, it's just an outpost. Uh, if you go back and look at this La Perouse person, um, the suburb itself, um, there it is in Sydney. As far as the man goes, we the history is, is that the, he, he basically had two boats, two ships, he arrived, Apparently two or three weeks before, um, or two or three days, they arrived two or three days after um, Governor Philip, apparently, two or three days after. Maybe they did, maybe that's the way it was. And then La Perouse was there for a while, it posted, and then he sailed off, and and then he's Astra La Bay, or whatever the boat was, and, uh, and he vanished. Um, and uh, that was it, and that was a big mystery. Apparently they found the shipwreck somewhere. So, uh, I think that's the history, I'll have to check. There's so much to go through. The interesting thing when you're trying to work out who is, who actually arrived, who built Sydney, or who built Melbourne, who built anything for that matter, are we talking about, um, we only have the information we have. So if you're trying to find out your ancestry, you have to go to these uh, these records that says, you know, passenger arrivals, and you got, and this is the government website, you've got unassisted free passengers, assisted passengers, convicts, okay? So unassisted is free passengers, this is probably the most interest. These are people that arrived in all the odd ships that, or the, they went on ships that were like cargo ships, under what's called steerage, which means that they were, they were in the midsection of the ship. And they're usually unrecorded. It says, until 1854, many unassisted passengers uh, were not listed individually on a passenger list. And you have to look at newspapers for this thing. In the early 1800s, where I think the point of contention is, is you only seem to have Austra uh, English-speaking newspapers. So I think that the French didn't really have, or, or whoever was here before the British, didn't really set up a strong, you could say Gaelic or Scottish or, or Welsh or whatever you want to call it, um, did, to a point where they actually were printing newspapers and doing all the usual things. They were probably living an idyllic lifestyle and I'll try to get the narrative out about that. Um, what is this, this is about La Perouse himself? Yeah, there he is, there, there's a picture of the man. Okay, so that makes it a little bit difficult to calculate what, what it's all about. Um, one of the things you've got to note about um, Sydney as well, or about New South Wales, 
is that you should actually refer to it as uh, what what the what, how it's pronounced in French. Pardon my French, I can't speak it very well. Is a uh, Nouvelle Gare de Sud, or Gare spelled G A W L E S, which is the French word for Wales. You look at all the old um, old maps, like 15th, 16th century. Wales is almost spelt Vales, like um, Valor or, or, or a walled in place. It's not, there's no reference to Gauls being. Why do the French call Wales Gaia, Gaul, and refer to what Welsh as Gaul? And why do they do that? Why do they have that overlap? So that's, and yet, well, yet Wales, the, etymo uh, the etymology is not going to be that because it's got the W, which is a like a V, so it makes it a bit difficult. Something to keep in mind. Now I've got some interesting photos. Okay, so uh, now I've got Melbourne to look at. I've got Sydney to look at. Now here are some lovely images from a lithograph. This is a great place, historyarchive.org. You get some great pictures there. 1836 lithograph. Uh, what this is? That's par that's a toll gate at Parramatta. This is but this is up to 1836. So got to remember this is. Not this is pr printed 1836, but it's not. It's not going to be 1836. Look at that! Look at that! I mean, <laughs> I mean, what, I mean, how amazing is that? I don't even know where these places are. I mean, that's in that's in um, that's the barracks, I think it is, it's, um, and that's a synagogue or something nearby. Uh, that's the police station, but it looks like a synagogue. That's like a government house or something. Look at the size of that. Look at the, how advanced that is. That's a, the government bathhouse? Or where's that? Oh, I can't even, don't even know where it is. I mean, this is amazing stuff. I mean, how, I, mean, I, I don't know what that is. I mean, look at that. That's already got all that set up. 836. I mean, that's incredible. Look at the lighthouse. Look at that. Look at this. Impressive. Okay. Impressive. And here it is in 1836, of course, you have a worn out broken windmill, completely destroyed. There's that, some castle thing down there. There's some of it washing the line. Oh yeah, they've just been here for ages. It's great. The, the, these lithographs give you an idea of what it would be up to that point and gives you some idea of the ruins and that kind of thing. I think that none of these things indicate that you have a strong French presence, you need to sort of define it as something else. I'm just trying to give you an idea of the flavour of Sydney would have been in the early days and how much effort has gone into it. If you want to look at like a French, um, there is, uh, this is a one by uh, Lesseur, which he was, a, he was a, the artist on the, um, of, this is, um, this is, Port Jackson, Sydney Cove, right? This is in 1803, and this is uh, on the Nicholas Bowden's voyage around the world. He went around Australia, did lots of uh, well, uh, scientific work, which was always raised an alarm bell with the locals thinking French are coming in. You've got to think that the French always did the artwork of Sydney. Whenever you see a French, or whenever you see uh, a British artwork of Sydney Cove, you, it's always on the opposite, it's always from a distance in the, from about 1790s all the way through to 1808. There's nothing of taken from inside the village until about 1810, 1812. And you get all this, you get all these big buildings everywhere, it's all fully populated, it's a complete port, it's everything's there. Yet, you never get the food, get, and this is 1803, and we know that the original P1 1788 had next to nothing to start with. And that's a, so you got that as well. To keep in mind, when people say French, British, French, British, right? You got to just rethink how, what, what that actually means. It doesn't mean necessarily anything much. First of all, modern French Republic is red, white, and blue, just like the Union Jack and all of the colors of the modern cartel. So. Yeah, anything that's gone into a democratic structure is red, white, and blue. Red, be, white, um, red and blue being the two houses, and, and well, actually, the, okay, the colours of 
the colors of this map. I'll just explain the map anyway, so you know how it works. Okay, so white is the is the connection to God. It's the purity. It's the it's it's like the it's the, more or less the house of the Senate. Red is the uh, royal decree. So it's, it's also um, the lower house. So it's the connection between God and you would you'd call that the representatives of God on earth. And blue is the administrative element or, or the actual bureaucracy. Um, it's the same colors in Egypt. So up, so white is upper house, upper Egypt, red is lower Egypt, and blue is the administration. So that's how the maps work. So when you ever were thinking about trying to decipher colors of the past and who are the goodies and who are the baddies, that kind of thing, basically red, white, and blue are the winners of today and later on the world and all that sort of stuff. And you've got to look at the belligerents. So Holy, so you've got yes, Holy Roman Empire, whatever that means. Uh, you would, um, but basically, you've got um, probably the uh, yeah, you've got basically various stakeholders uh, which were not this group. Um, so, so you could when you're defining France, I'd say you'd have to define it in uh, in any number of ways, like whether it's the House of Bourbon or or you know, take your pick. It's uh, I'm not really sure. So, just keep that in mind. Um, the in, other interesting thing is when you're trying to work out French language, uh, the uh, langue de, uh, I can't pronounce it, the oil or, or, or il, uh, is the origin of the French language. Uh, is that the French today comes from these various French prototypes. Um, Rather than the southern uh, ones, where they where they basically pronounce it phonetically, you know, similar to Spanish, in the north they actually spoke of it differently, almost like I would say the Moors um, in in the uh, in Haiti uh, in the Creole they tend to speak Creole like they speak French, and it's, I would almost say that the Moors influenced the pronunciation style from Western Africa. So just sort of give that interesting slant which i'll probably talk about some other time um melbourne uh let's talk about melbourne melbourne's a bit of a mystery as well this is some lithographs from uh that, that date to 1864 um and you get and i the, each lithograph isn't individually dated but apparently melbourne was founded in 1835 which is of course totally wrong I've talked about it in the early videos. Um, it was definitely people there beforehand. But these are the images from 1864 uh, lithographs. I think there's, there might be photos. This is one. Of, this is probably the most interesting to me because I don't know. I don't think Melbourne was a French place. I think I, I think it was mixed, right? I don't know who was there, but there's a flag there, and this is. Um, uh, something Big Nall's new hotel. New hotel. There's a red dot and a colour there, and that's the British flag. This is. I'll show you some touched-up images a bit later on. But um, these aren't these aren't touched up. I don't think. But what, whoever, whatever that flag is, we should find out. That'll be very interesting. If I'll look it up. Um, but it's just insane. Like this, up to 1864, you got the whole coach to that station. This is just, this is just amazingly complicated for a, a city like so early. There's a, there's a fantastic photo somewhere, I think. Um, just staggering amount of detail. Here we go. Look at that. Look at that. 1863. Look at that. Let's, let's have a look at what that is. Denker's Globe Tavern. That's, that's, uh, well, I don't know, it was black and white. Is that uh, an Irish flag? Whatever that is. Yeah, and it, look, it looks like it's English. You gotta think again though, that what's English anyway? But two languages smashed over, or three languages pushed together. I mean, if you, I mean, the people that took over, they could have taken over, you know, different variations of English. They said, oh, well, you know, you've got a lot, you've got some, you know, Frisian people, you've got 
and they just combine the English as they invade each one. That's a huge amount of uh, um, uh, structure in Melbourne. But it definitely has a sort of an, an Irish flavour. Patterson. Mm. Yeah, I'm going to go over sort of an Irish Gaelic. Once again, what it, what it, what is the definition of it? So something to talk about, to think about. That's a good one. That's amazing. All right. So one thing I wanted to point out was one of the Sydney. Uh, back to Sydney again. Sorry, I'm jumping around, but that's what I'm doing. I think there was one. Oh, these boats. Oh man, which one is it? Oh, all right. Oh wait, hold on. That's brilliant. I'll go back to the collection. Oh no, it'll take me a while. There was an image of a ship. Um, they, uh, uh that was there. Um, it was a, it was a ship. Uh, and a scene of Australia. And what it, what it showed was, and I sh I'll put the image later on, you know, as an addendum, but it showed the, um, uh, the big whopping British flag on a ship, but it was like 10 times the size of a flag you'd normally have. So obviously they touched it up. It was a scene of New South Wales and, and it was done in the early 1800s, but you can, there's so much development and all the British flags are painted in uh, as afterwards. So that's particularly interesting. I'll show it later on. Okay, moving on. Some of the photos, um, I went to uh, Melbourne um, some years ago um, before I, when I could go. And uh, I noticed some of the strange architecture around the University of, uh, oh God, sorry, around the Melbourne University. Uh, some of you will probably recognize it. Um, you know, these cherubs, this sort of, kind, of, kind of thing. I keep seeing this cross a lot. Uh, I, I kept seeing these gaps and these things taken down. Yep, no parking sign. So there's that sort of thing. That's, that's a good one. Ah, uh, oh, here we are. This is it. This is particularly interesting. In one of the buildings in Melbourne University, they decided to put this photo up of the skull and bones. This is from the early 1900s. Uh, and it's right next to the archaeology department. So whatever that means, I have no idea what that could possibly mean, but it doesn't look very good, does it? Uh, so um, the archaeology department, so go figure that one out. Um, another thing that I want to talk about is, uh, God, I'm you again, sorry. Um, There's just so, so much in Melbourne that makes no sense. The, archi arch the architecture is so unusual. And just picking on the French um, genre again, we have, um, this is, I think, a German map, but anyway, uh, you, you'll see Bowden's land here, reference, Bowden's land. What would you call I mean, that's amazing. Isn't it? Bowden's land. There's, um, on the other map front, um, that's amazing map, sir. You have Golf Bonaparte, which is in Spencer Golf. And I think he called something crazy down here. One of these islands around Port Phillip is called French Island, so there's another reference. Um, so that's that, there's some interesting consistency. So I would say that you need to expand your um, view of what you would call Gaelic or French or something, because obviously it's it's more to it than meets the eye. New South Wales in French is uh, Nouvelle Gaule de Sud, uh, as I said before. That's a bit strange. A couple other characters that we need to talk about. Uh, a couple other things actually. Um, when I was going through Sydney, I found a few oddities. Uh, very strange, very, very strange um, items indeed. Uh, 
but I don't know how to find them just right now. Okay. But anyway, the Archibald Fountain is apparently a French... Well, here we go. I'll st I'm sorry I'm jumping around. This is a map of Australia Feli or Felix. So they call this whole area Australia Feli. Right, and this, this is the Port Phillip District. So what would you call all this Australia Philly? What, what Philly what? So when you're trying to say is it the, is it the French are the goodies and the British are the baddies? No, I don't think so. I think they're both the baddies. And I think it's all it is is a bunch of everyday people trying to get away from all the pain and trying to live an independent life that, that, and that are trying to get on with things that are actually doing the right thing. So that's what I think about that. Um, There was a, here we go. Another thing about, I found about that, I, obviously the Archibald Fountain, where you have your uh, you know, Apollo or wherever it is. Let's look at this for, for example. This is the Archibald Fountain in Hyde Park, Sydney, which was apparently uh, designed by, by a French, uh, a French uh, artist of, uh, uh, by, called Sicard. And Sicard was apparently the man of the day. Um, so, and you know, he's done all these amazing works that no one cares about, like something like this and a few sculptures. I mean, the, his work is, is, is minor compared to that. But apparently he was the real deal. He was amazing. There he is, he's great. To celebrate, and he built this thing, the, the uh, amazing structure that we have in Hyde Park to celebrate French and Australian relations. Uh, or 100 years of it or something like that unveiled in 1932 of all times which is roughly 100 years after 1832 you know, when you know, 1835 you have Port Phillip being taken over so who knows what that means um, the Ashwood Fountain itself it's, so it's supposed to be French there's Apollo uh, holding a lyre here's, Di here's Diana and the two dogs and the archer. So that's the Sagittarius sign. So this is all, so this is all going to be full of cosmology. What have you got? We've got the other guy You're taking care of a goat and putting his hand on the ram's head. And of course, there's the other guy who's wrestling with the and about to slay the bull. So. As you, as you guys all know, the bull is Taurus, and, and Taurus was slain to make way for, you guessed it, for Aries, which is the procession of Aries, which is the age of the Shepherd Kings, which is what the Torah is all about. And here's the guy taking care of the goat, which is us. We're the goat, and he's holding the sheep and the ram, and that's it. So this is all great. And there's another interesting one. I've just that I've got to just raise it. It's just really... It really, it really is just not a novel, tiny little thing. Um, uh, where is it? It was just it had like two fishes or something. It was it was like two fishes spewing up or something, and two fishes as Pisces. So you got to think about that as well. And going back to the images that I was trying to show you in Melbourne, um, coincidentally. In the historical part of Melbourne, right towards the, 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 the eastern part where you've got the old palm trees and the really old buildings, they've decided to put this sculpture of Diana and the two dogs again. Once again, I think she's holding a, doing a, is she holding a mobile and doing a selfie? I don't know. Anyway, so you see this theme of Diana, two dogs, which is the inverse of the Roman symbol of the um, hyena woman. It's not a wolf, the she-wolf, but it's a hyena. And the two boys suckling, so that's a, that. That Diana is almost the inverse of that. Interesting. Okay, so what else do you want to talk about? Um, William Bly was now William Bly. Um, you read his history. He's born somewhere at Plymouth, England, but actually, no one actually knows where he was born. Really, this is all conjecture. And he fights against Napoleon, apparently, whatever that means. He's, um, he married someone in uh, the Scottish. He, then he ends up getting on a French ship, Belle Poulet or whatever that is. 
And then he's a complete catastrophe, he's a tyrant, mutiny on the bounty, bounty, bounty. he ends up going to station at Sydney Cove. It's a disaster, he mistreats the military. There's a civil war called the Rum Rebellion. And that's where I would say that the powers were truly transferred as it was eventually transferring from the, from, from the, from the in, uh, indigenous, obviously, the settlers of the new Sydney Cove area and and probably creating a civil war and they just call it the Rumi Bell. I mean, why not? But he somehow but somehow he he just got tried, he came back, he, they gave him some land that didn't wasn't even recorded. Um, it's a, curiously here we go. He's got some land. Curiously enough there was no mention of these grants in the dispatches. So he, he got land that's not recorded. That's what everything about it is weird. The, how, he, how he's hiding under a bed when the, the army come, how he's, how he's captured and he's released and he, I mean, what is this? I mean, it's almost like it's chaos in the making. And he's the guy that's, that's the governor and he's, and he's in charge. And then he's, he's, he's during the whole period of this catastrophe with transition of power from 1808 to 1810. And then Sydney's obviously fully British controlled. And of course, and of course, then you get the watercolor paints pictures of artists doing it from inside Sydney Cove. You don't see it before then. If you do find a watercolor of Sydney Cove from within Sydney Cove dated prior to 1810, let me know. I don't think there's any. Maybe there is. I don't think so. So there's a whole bunch of catastrophe going on. And I think in the end, there's a really good map that's kind of says it all. And also at the same time, says absolutely nothing that makes any sense to me. Uh, and it could be, it could be this one. This map is a map that was uh, of an explorer of Port Phillip, um, William, yeah, William Thomas Protector. Uh, but this is, I think, a map, a hand-drawn map of Western Port District of the original place names, 1830s, apparently. Um, okay, so just to, just to take note, um, there is, that's the old settlement. That's Western Port, that's French Island. This is, this is interesting. Um, you've got really interesting names here. Fleming, Herist, Bremen. It's almost a very, oh, it's a forgotten language. Port Phillip was actually called Nern. There you go. And Williamstown, Gillibrand. It's really got a sort of almost, we've almost got to try to extract, not just Irish, but maybe it's a sort of a, 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 some kind of Western Gaelic, you know, you know one, of the, one of the Belgian languages almost. It's just odd. What have you got? Um, Melbourne, it says Melbourne of Noe, uh, and you see these little lines. There you go. It's a settlement. It's an actual settlement in the 1830s. I would, I don't know. It says 1839-ish apparently, but it could be anything. It could be, you know, it's got all these other names on it. So I'm going with the fact that it's before all their chicanery and coming in. And these are actual, like these are stations like Dawson Garden. These are people that have actual you know, various splitters huts yeah look at that this is like a this is and this is this is he did not this is not by his definition of words this is the original township this is a map that's probably showing what i was what, what was actually going on at the time and this would be a, the <laughs> most accurate map of it all but alas i can't say as much french people really anywhere in sydney or or Melbourne, more Sydney, but I'd say that we're talking about a more of a Gaelic peoples, an older world peoples, a little bit more akin to the old Hebraic, Hebrew type Gaelics, perhaps if you can get into that a bit more detail. So that's it. It's a bit of a rant, but hopefully it doesn't take too long. I wish you all Merry Christmas. And I'll speak to you later.